Okay, so what I, I aim to do in my talk is to, to be maybe a little bit less detail focused than the other talks ahead of us and just kind of put the icing on the cake with a, a, almost like a 20,000 foot view of, of things that you talk about when you go to the doctor's office, especially in the setting of having disease that's advanced. And so the title of my talk is Manip Manipulating the Tumor and the Immune System, Lessons Learned in Melanoma and Beyond. And we were, we were talking at one of the breaks how uh, maybe in, two, I remember it was 2006 because I was still a fellow at Yale. And uh, one of our other major leaders in our field, Dr. Lynn Schechter at the University of Pennsylvania, gave a session at one of our national meetings and said, you know, look at, look at this decade of research. We've made no progress. You know, everybody's got to step it up a notch, okay? And maybe she had a crystal ball and she could see all the good stuff that was ahead. But the bottom line is that I think what happened is as a consequence of being such a tight-knit community who also had access to tissue. A lot of times, the melanoma lesions in the pictures you've been seeing, that tissue is very easy to biopsy and to study. Um, what's happened is we were then able to really band together as a community with technologic advances and really make some strides, and, and in many ways are kind of the poster child for what the rest of oncology is doing at this point. Um, and so that's going to be kind of the thrust of, of what I'm going to be talking about. And so this kind of speaks to what I just said. This was a, a, slide, a slide that I, I would use in my, my talks to the fellows when I first got here. It's a, an abstract from the New England Journal of Medicine. These are all trials that were done with chemotherapy. And the bottom line is they're pretty much all negative, okay? And so, boy, have times changed. We have really started to, to get away from negative studies, although there, there may be some role for chemotherapy in patients that have very, very rapidly advancing disease that I, we need to kind of get under control quickly. But I think in the face of these new therapies, that role is slim. And so my overview is that in 2014, Targeted therapies are, are a class of therapies that are used to manipulate the tumor, and we'll talk about that more in detail. You've heard a little bit about that from, from Dr. Carvajal just now, but, but a lot of the, the drugs that you've heard me talk about are drugs that inhibit proteins in, uh, uh, called BRAF and MEK. And the problem is that a lot of times this approach leads to the, the shrinkage of the tumor, but the eventual development of resistance. Just like with antibiotics, cancers get smart. Antibiotics... Uh, uh, microbes uh, develop resistance, and, and tumors can develop resistance, too. And so then we have kind of the, the polar opposite, in, in my opinion, immunotherapies. So, so actually, I, when I was creating this talk, I remembered this amazing seventh grade teacher I had who really taught me how to write. She was just great. And so she would always you know, compare, contrast. And I, I really try to set that up for patients when I, I talk to them about these opportunities because I think it helps you differentiate why we would use one class of therapies versus others. Um, and so in many ways, immunotherapies are the contrast to targeted therapies, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about some of the intratumoral vaccine approaches. We'll talk about some novel immune compounds and the anti-PD-1 and PDL one pathway that we've already heard a little bit about. So the bottom line is that we've got five FDA-approved therapies since 2011 and probably another one in the works. And as I said, this is probably as a result, first of all, of very, very motivated patients who, who seek out trials and seek out education and seek out improving their situation and the situation of others, as well as a small driven community with access to tissue. So targeted therapies, what do we talk about? The key aspects, the, 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 the bullet points. Often, I would say these, these therapies result in a relatively high response rate, okay? Sometimes if, if you, your, your tumor has a mutation in, in a protein called BRAF, you, the response rate could be you know, over 50%, and it, it can often be quick and dramatic, okay? Many of you, if, if you're my patients or relatives of patients, when you come in the clinic, I, I do like to show pictures and say, okay, this is what you look like before, and this is what it looks like now. Um, and so, so that's very useful if you're feeling very sick or symptomatic from, from cancer. Um, I will say that many of these drugs result in chronic toxicities, okay? It, it is some, no drug, as we've mentioned earlier, is without side effects. And so often, when these medications are given, um, you, you adjust to them and then you develop a tolerance of that side effect and the next thing you know, you get another side effect. So these side effects are not necessarily amazingly intense or require or result in hospitalization, but they can often be chronic. Um, these responses to these agents are rarely durable, meaning that almost always the resistance develops and the disease rears its ugly head again. Um, it's important to know the target and targeted therapy, okay? A lot of times in, in drug development, we're giving drugs, and if we don't know the, the exact target of the drug, 
it's, it makes it very difficult to assess how the drug is working and if the drug is working. And also, we don't really know how to prevent resistance, although there is a lot of work going on in this arena currently. <laughs> so this is also quite a, quite a busy slide, what we alluded to earlier. And so you'll see a lot of the proteins we've already talked about. The BRAF tumors, the BRAF mutation is about 50 to 65 percent, and RAS 15 to 20 percent. Uh, and we've talked about uh, other, other proteins, C-kit, um, you know, there's the whole melanoma cell. And, and now we're really starting to delve into other ones like PI3 kinase and AKT. And so this is what a schematic, if you were to take your tumor, take a biopsy of that tumor, and send it out for very sophisticated genetic sequencing where they really get down to the nitty-gritty of what the DNA that makes that tumor looks like, this is, these are the kind of molecules we're looking for things that are broken or aberrant, okay? And so what happened uh, uh, initially is, and this was uh, about the patient I was alluding to earlier, um, is that in around, I guess, 2007, 2008, we started to, to run trials in, uh, in a, uh, tumors which had a mutation in that pink cell, BRAF B608. So there was a Nature paper in 2002 which showed that 50 to 60 percent of tumors have this mutation. And then logically, a drug was developed to see if it could interfere with the signaling of that protein. Um, and doing so would hopefully, per, you know, result in growth arrest of the tumor. And the drug that you see on, on uh, the right-hand side was developed by a scientist named Yossi Schlesinger at Yale, who really, you know, used very, very sophisticated chemistry to figure out how to, to get into the pocket of that activated molecule and stop its, and stop its activity. And the results were not subtle, okay? They were very, very dramatic. So these are some pictures that were lent to me by my colleague Keith Laherty, who's now at Mass General. And if you look, the, the pictures on the left, all the black stuff tends to be cancer, and the pictures on the right are responses to therapy. And so you can see that these drugs induce dramatic responses, and, and often dramatic clinical responses. People who feel very sick are all of a sudden able to, to function again, and, and that's very, very satisfying. However, as I've alluded to, what happens is the tumors eventually get smart and they may develop new, new mutations in other parts of the pathway, or they, where the, the tumor then allows to, tumor then becomes um, resistant to drug, or the drug actually forces a mode of tumor progression. And so in doing that, what happens is the drug eventually start, stops working. And it's signaling in uh, many uh, situations through another pathway called RAS, okay? So what we've done there is then develop a drug which then essentially <coughs> attacks that RAS mutation, and that's where many of you may have heard about the MEK inhibitors that we've discussed early today. So while initially we gave just one drug for the treatment of advanced melanoma, either vemurafenib or dubrafenib, which inhibit just the BRAF, now we try to stop the, the aberrant or abnormal force signaling through this pathway here with a drug called trametinib. And what we found is that combination will result in longer time to progression in patients with melanoma. And sometimes it's, it's pretty rare for, in my practice that I use the single agents because I know that then there's, there's going to be unopposed activity of another active pathway. However, when you add a second drug, you maybe get rid of one set of side effects, but you develop another. And so I, I make my decisions based on the patient that's in front of me and what kind of other medical problems they may have, what other medications they may be taking. I think the lessons that we've learned in terms of uh, trying to develop targeted therapy is that tissue is the issue. And so there was, as a, as a and, and uh, Valerie, you may certainly <laughs> enlighten me on your thoughts on this later on, but I think for a long time there was a, 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 an initiative in cancer research that getting biopsies was somehow an undue burden on the patient. And in many cases, a biopsy isn't right for it, and it is an undue burden. But I, I've also had many patients who have said, if this, if you can take a piece of this and it's just going to help you learn more, then please, you know, this is if we can do this without a lot of morbidity, um, a lot of a lot of uh, complications, without a lot of pain, and it's going to help you advance the field, then it's very very important. So I think now we're really starting to see we have to ask ourselves instead of why are we putting the tissue in the trial, why are we not putting the tissue in the trial? I think it's very important to to advancing our field. Um, I think there should be a campaign called Your Tumor, Your Life, all right, because one of the things that I have found is it's, it can be very difficult to get the, the chunks of tumor in our hands that we need to run these sophisticated genetic tests. 
Um, and certainly when it, when it, you know, the patient's operated on by Dr. Goidos and is in our institution, it's maybe not such an issue because I can call the pathologist and I know her name and I can walk over there and, you know, buy her lunch if I need to. So, you know, I mean, the bottom line is that, you know, it, it's, it, the inner workings of the system is, is you know, much, much, um, much easier. However, um, if you're coming from three hours away at a hospital and you need to sign consent and the slides got shipped and they weren't in your hands when you got here and you're relying on another department somewhere else and, and we're calling every day trying to get that, it can be very difficult um, to get the information that we need to treat you. And, and so I, I really think that there needs to be a patient education aspect to that about how important it is to have not just the pathology reports but the access to your actual tissue so that we can help figure out how to treat you. As I, I mentioned with the, my choices of when do I use one drug, when do I use two drugs, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, okay? Every patient is individual. One of the best things that happens here is when you come into our clinic, you really do get an individualized treatment plan customized for you, and you get the benefit of having surgeons, radiation doctors, medical oncologists all in the same under the same roof that are able to implement that. I think studying the mechanisms of resistance are absolutely critical. Um, this is how we're going to figure out, you know, if you're one of those people that got a great response on, on a combination targeted therapy, how we're going to be going to maintain that. And this has, again, led to other um, tumor success stories. For instance, in lung cancer, there's a trial called the BATTLE trial, which has been very similar to a similar approach to, to developing new therapies. And it's also really the, the kind of what kicked off a precision medicine initiative at many institutions across the country. And I'll just take two seconds to talk about what the Precision Medicine Initiative at, at, uh, at Rutgers Cancer Institute is uh, here. So precision medicine is when we're really, we're trying to use, again, very in-depth sequencing technologies to find out what's driving your tumor genetically and to also figure out, is there a way that we can, we can uh, target this with medication to, to control your cancer? And again, it sounds like it's, it should be very feasible. It should be very you know, simple to implement. And let me tell you, it takes a lot of work. Um, what happens is we, when we finally do get the tumor in our hands. We send that, the, the tumor out to, we, we work with a company that's called Foundation One. They're based in Boston. And we get a report back, which essentially you know, sometimes looks like alphabet soup. Um, and essentially, sometimes the mutations, like in melanoma, are very obvious. They're in BRAF. Um, we know we have a drug to target that. But sometimes not. Sometimes it's in, it's in a, a, a protein that we're not sure we can target quite so well, such as PI3K or AKT. And then what happens is we actually have a, an actual tumor board, which meets here on Fridays. And it's composed of a pretty sophisticated team. Um, we have a geneticist. We have a scientist who specializes in genetics. Um, and then we have you know, the treating physicians are generally there. And we talk about which of the mutations are easily targetable and which are the ones that we need to think a little bit more and maybe we should be enrolling those patients on a clinical trial. And so what happens, and one of the reasons why now more than ever we really need to work together as a community, is instead of all melanoma just being melanoma and all being treated the exact same way, when we find that, you know, for instance, you have a mutation in one area or a mutation in another area, all of a sudden melanoma gets broken up into, you know, a whole bunch of different types. And this applies not just to melanoma but to other cancers as well. Um, and so then you really have to say, okay, well, I'll never be able to do a study just in melanoma just at my institution anymore. I've really got to work with other people across the country because, you know, I need to, to identify more patients that have this genetic aberration so I can study it properly. And that's what we call basket study. So, for instance, they're not in melanoma, but in um, uh, thyroid cancer and other cancers ongoing currently that have a BRAF mutation, there are studies across the country that look at rare tumor types to try to figure out um, what is the best way to, to, to target that particular tumor. Um, a lot of these studies are being done by industry, but there's also a national initiative, which we're part of here, called the MATCH trial. And that is essentially, you know, you have a drug, we're going to identify as many of these tumors across the country that have a mutation in this particular pathway, and then we're going to enroll those patients on one study and, and collect the data and figure out if we can actually target this pathway. Um, and so for those of you that may be interested in hearing about basal carcinoma, for instance, there's a drug that you may have heard of called Aravage. I, I won't try to say the, the generic name because I can't pronounce it. Um, and that, it's, it, that targets a mutation called Smoothint. Well, that's a trial that I'll be actually heading up to, to figure out with, in collaboration with uh, PIs from MD Anderson and Memorial, um, where do the Smoothint mutations function in other types of cancer and will this drug work for them? 
I think when we hit multiple targets within a tumor, we do wind up with more toxicities. Um, so certainly for, so what's ironic, as I mentioned earlier, when we target both the BRAF pathway and the MEK pathway, if you just use a BRAF inhibitor, you actually wind up with a lot of uh, toxicities that are un from the unopposed signaling of this pathway when, when your body develops resistance to the BRAF inhibitor. So when you give the two drugs, ironically, you don't get as many of those initial side effects. And, and those may be um, a lot of people get facial wasting, they may get thinning of their hair, secondary skin cancers, and even colon polyps um, can be very important. So when you use the MEK inhibitor, those things don't necessarily happen, but then there's other sets of, of toxicities that come into play. Um, I think that we have to worry a little bit more about uh, eye toxicities, uh, clots in, the, in the, the veins in your eyes or clots throughout other parts of your body, in your lungs, uh, in your liver even. So it's something that you kind of trade one set of drugs for the other. But then if you start to drug multiple pathways within the soul, cell, Jim, I mean, this is Jim's a, uh, uh, term he, he calls it playing whack-a-mole. Play whack-a-mole in the boardwalk. All right. So you 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 know you hit one pathway, another one pops up. We can't be given four or five drugs because you know the, the number of side effects would just be prohibitive. So I think that that's something we really have to think about as we're using this targeted therapy approach going forward. So let's now step back and talk about immunotherapies or manipulating the immune system. So key aspects of immunotherapy. So what we're trying to do with immunotherapy is very different from what we're trying to do with target therapy. Targeted therapy, we're really trying to attack the tumor itself. Immunotherapy, we're trying to make use of your natural resources to fight your cancer, and that's your immune system. Um, so what we're trying to do is really rev up your immune system to, to fight your cancer. But in doing that, sometimes we can rev it up a little bit too much, and then your cancer, can, your immune system can then uh, sort of attack your other you know, normal vital organs. And so I say that this could be associated with what we call autoimmune adverse events. We often calm these down with steroids. Sometimes we need to use even other additional immunosuppressive agents. So these, these drugs have a unique kinetics of response. Sometimes we, when we, and this, is, this mostly pertains to ipilimumab, but also a little bit to the newer one, PD-1, as well. Sometimes we see stable disease on scans, and then we start to see a slow, steady decline in total tumor volume. Sometimes we see a response after an initial increase in tumor volume. So that first set of scans, I say, oh, you know, things look a little bit bigger, but don't worry. It can be a little bit nerve-wracking as a patient. I we, you know, need to educate you about that up front. Sometimes we see a response in the first lesion we saw, but we see new lesions. Um, and sometimes we see a continued benefit of treatment um, after continued benefit after we treat uh, progressing lesions that are you know getting bigger in the face of other lesions that are getting smaller. So I would say relatively these have a low response rate and I'm not talking about the combinations together because that's, that's totally a separate issue but, but when you give these drugs on their own compared to you know the BRAF drugs where a lot of times you get a response you know more than 50 percent of the time you know, these are you know maybe sometimes 20 with some of the newer agents 30 percent of the time and instead of the chronic toxicities where, oh, geez, it's another, another week where I got to go see Dr. Maynard again, and I, I got to go see her again because I developed something else, I, I find that these side effects tend to be more out of the blue and more unpredictable and what I call fast and furious, okay? So meaning that a lot of times, even if they may, if they may start like a smoldering fire, if we don't address them quickly, they could turn into big trouble. All right, and a lot of you have heard me lecture and give you little cards and say, you know, if you wind up in an emergency room, don't leave that emergency room until they call me, okay? Um, it's important, I think, you know, to talk about targets. Yeah, we know the targets in the Im immune therapy, but in terms of, you know, figuring out who's going to respond to those, we're not quite as good in terms of the, the targeted therapies where, you know, we are pretty much guaranteed that if you have a BRAF mutation, you're going to get some form of a response to a BRAF inhibitor. And I would say that resistance is uh, less of an issue. A lot of times these, these drugs, when they work, they really work. They can, they can give you a nice long-term durable remission. And so this is a cartoon that is busy, but I'd like to, this is what I, I many of you have probably seen the slideshow. I keep, my, I keep it on my laptop. Um, this is a, a schematic of your immune system. And, and I have my brother and my sister-in-law are cops, okay? So I'm going to dumb this down a little bit. <laughs> this, is, this is what I call the garbage man, all right? So he kind of goes around, when you get sick, you get a virus, it goes around, he picks it up, brings it to what I call the police officer. And he kind of gets all revved up and excited. This is your T-cell. All right, and essentially these, these red things are function as brakes, like brakes on, brakes on a car to keep the T-cell in check, okay? So what we want to do is, is rev this up, get it excited just a little bit 
just enough so that it fights your cancer, but it doesn't go crazy and, and attack you. And that's where the, what we call the drugs called checkpoint inhibitors come in. So this is a CTLA-4 that is the ipilimumab drug that blocks that molecule. And then PD-1, pembrolizumab, or Keytruda is the new name, or nivolumab is, uh, uh, nivolumab uh, blocks this area here. Okay, and so again, what we're trying to do is take advantage of your natural resources to, to fight your tumor. And what we know is that if you, you successfully block that first molecule, the CTLA-4, you can augment immune responses. Um, and so essentially, this is why, you know, ipilimumab will actually work. And even if it initially shows a pattern of tumor growth, your tumor may eventually begin to shrink. And so this is a, a slide of, of one of my patients who was treated when I was a fellow at Yale. Um, and essentially, you know, you could see the, this area here on the left, this is a lot of tumor within the lungs. And then that's a really nice response that the patient enjoyed with no progression after five years. Um, and so again, when these drugs work, it's like winning the lottery. They really work. It's a nice long-term durable remission. Um, and then this is the, the pivotal, the slide from the, the pivotal trial um, that was, uh, came out where in 2010, where essentially, you know, for the first time ever in a randomized study in melanoma, a drug actually showed a survival benefit, which was very, very exciting. So then we, now we're moving on to the new drugs, PD-1 and PD-L1. And this is actually a slide, this is actually Dr. Kaufman's slide, and he showed it earlier, where essentially you are now working with different checkpoints on, on your immune system. You have PD-1, which is a receptor on your T cell, he's the police officer guy. And then you have PD-L1, which is a molecule in the tumor cell that interacts with PD-1 to set off, set off that whole interaction. And so PD-L1 interacts with PD-1 to deliver a signal that inhibits T cell functions. And the blockade of the PD-1 and PD-L1 interaction releases T cells from immunosuppression and therefore enhances anti-tumor immunity. So it's a very similar concept to, to ipilimumab. And what we generally find is that these, you know, these agents, you know, they, they work better, they are better tolerated, they have a higher response rate. And so, and, and while they do also result in unpredictable fast and furious toxicities, it appears to be uh, a little bit more manageable than, than what we've seen with ipilimumab. So this is just a slide, it's actually quite an old slide of, a, of that um, uh, my former mentor, Mario Schnoll, had shared with me from Yale, looking at the initial, you know, response rates in, in kidney cancer, in melanoma, and in lung cancer. And when we were first seeing these drugs, and, and we were like, wow, this is, this, is, this is pretty neat stuff, okay? And so again, another, another shot of, of uh, one of my former patients, I had left Yale at the time that this patient was treated, where, uh, you know, there was a very large, large tumor which got some nice shrinkage with treatment. Um, so again, it's, it's, you know, a very, very important weapon in our armamentarium of, of fighting this disease. And so what happens often time in drug development is that when, you know, an exciting drug comes out on the market, many companies rush to that same scene and try to build a cousin to that and, and see if we can build it better. Um, and one of these is, again, the, the agent that Dr. Kaufman alluded to earlier that we have in clinical trials here at the Cancer Institute for patients with melanoma that have uh, had, had not had response to ipilimumab. But we also, interestingly, have this as a trial in patients with Merkel cell carcinoma. So this is another type of skin cancer um, that it, it is on the rise, and it is also, should it you know, spread to vital organs, can be life-threatening. And, and so we've had the, the pleasure of, of running this study here. Um, and then what also happens is that there's other, again, other types of tumors, that other, other tumor types that want to start looking at, at these agents, and then also looking at the drugs in combination. So, you know, you could go crazy thinking about, you know, how there's so many agents in oncology right now. What, what are you going to combine this with next to see if you can, you can figure that out? And I think that's part of where the field is going. Now, again, one of the things that I want to touch on is that unlike... The, the target therapies that we talked about, um, when you have a, uh, a mutation in BRAF, again, it's a very good what we call predictive marker. It can predict response to therapy. And so we're struggling a bit in the immunotherapy arena to find that same predictive marker, specific, specifically for, for PD-1 and, and PD-L1. And so what, what has been published out there is that high expression tends to correlate with responses. So if you have higher expression, your chances of a response may be greater. However, um, the absence of it does not rule out that you will get a response. So it does put us in a little bit of a, a, a confusing situation in trying to figure out who would benefit from therapy most. And I think this is going to be a very hot topic of clinical investigation moving forward. But as you can see from this slide, you have multiple different tumor types, which all of which have you know, different areas of expression. 
of uh, the PDL1 ligand, which may give us some idea of whether or not we should prescribe this therapy for you. Um, and we are actually running a trial um, from um, with the newly approved agent Katruda here. And that's essentially to, the, what the company has done is identified 20 tumor types in which there is an unmet need, given us the list. And this trial actually does require that PDL1 expression to see whether or not um, you would be eligible for entry. And so, for example, some of the tumor types are, we have some neuroendocrine tumors, nasopharyngeal carcinoma that's driven by a virus, um, anal cancers, which was one of the unmet needs that was put up on uh, Dr. Carvajal's uh, slide earlier. And so, you know, there's maybe, like I said, there's 20 cancers where we're really investigating uh, the efficacy of this agent. Um, and so I think that's going to be a very, very exciting uh, study when it's published because we'll, you know, get to see, first of all, which cohorts are, are necessarily going to have more activity, but also we'll really learn a little bit more about whether the expression of this protein gives us enough information that we need. So in summary, I would say that the PD-1 pathway antagonists, they actually show broad anti-tumor activity. This just isn't, you know, related to melanoma. We've seen it in melanoma, kidney, lung, maybe even colon, gastric, head, and echovarian. Those are more areas of, of study at this point. And so it's going to be explored a lot. I think you're going to hear a lot about this agent in coming months. Um, you know, is PD-1 blockade better than PD-L1? You know, what happens when you combine the therapies? It's just not yet clear. Um, I would say that objective responses and unconventional tumor responses can be durable, and they can persist even after the drug is stopped. Um, Well-tolerated low rate of grade 3, 4 AEs. Well, you know, I think that's, a, that's a, a statement that has to be tempered with, you know, caution that eventually, it, 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 overall, it's a low rate of grade 3, 4, 4 AEs when you're talking about, you know, uh, PD-1 and IPI, it is a low rate. Well tolerated, it depends on if you're one of those patients that gets a side effect, right? So I think we can overall say that that the PD-1 drug is is fairly well tolerated. Ipilimumab, I, I still have concerns. I, I find that when the, the drug does decide to, to act up the immune system in a certain way, sometimes it can be very tricky uh, to calm it down again. Um, there are phase three trials that, you know, actually some of these have accrued already in melanoma, kidney, and lung cancer. Um, responses, I think we, we can probably say they'll, they're enriched by the high expression of the PDL1 tumor. But again, you know, the jury's still out on why do we have that, that portion of patients who don't have that expression that are still responding. Um, there's a lot of combinations that are in development. I didn't talk too much about the recent uh, data where both the ipilimumab and the nivolumab, which is a, a PD1 drug that Bristol Myers Squibb had developed. Um, in combination. The response rates are higher, the toxicities are higher, the survival is higher. So it will remain to be seen if that's going to wind up becoming a, one of our new standards of care in, in this arena, so stay tuned. And I think that the mechanisms of acquired resistance, you know, are still unknown in terms of immunotherapy, although it's something we're really working on. So overall, in summary, I think that tweaking the immune system can be highly effective in fighting this disease. There are patients where I'm holding my breath thinking maybe we even you know, got this controlled forever. Let, let's hope so. I think manipulating the tumor environment is, is a key portion of that in, in terms of the immune therapies their, and their efficacy. And I think it'll be important to, to watch how we can do that in combinations together. Um, I think that resistance mechanisms are, you know, again, unclear, but we've got exciting activity in lung, renal, and multiple other tumor types, and the combinations are under exploration. So in summary, for the whole talk, targeted therapies do have a role in the treatment of melanoma, especially in patients with bulky disease. If you were to say to me, doctor, how would I choose? How, how would I choose? You know, we are actually planning, although they've been planned for such a long time, it, it gets frustrating, but we are planning trials where we can figure out if you give one agent followed by another, does it make a difference? Does it make a difference which order we do things? For now, we kind of, or at least I in my practice, kind of apply the common sense rule. If somebody comes in and feels really sick, and I need to get a response very quickly, I use the BRAF inhibitor. It just has a higher chance of, of granting a response. Immunotherapies have a lower response rate, but a chance of a durable remission. So it's generally my first line of therapy if somebody comes into the office and, and they're not very sick without large volumes of disease. Um, one of the things that I just think is so important um, is that the standard of care in melanoma should remain a clinical trial. So we've got all these new agents. And as we mentioned earlier, clinical trials are not right for anybody. It has to be right for you as the patient. Your doctor you know, has to feel it's the right thing for you. But I do think that it's, it's just so important to continue the progress that we've made. 
we've got to remember that even with all these you know advances we are by no means curing every patient and until we have that situation down pat I think we just have more work to do so I do think that we really have to focus on continued enrollment to clinical research um, to, to advance this field and I think to, to remember that when we do use drugs in combination, we might enhance response, but we're probably also going to enhance toxicities in patients, and we'll have to pay very, very close attention on how we manage them as physicians and how we educate you as patients to, to, to help us manage them as well. But overall, I think it's a really exciting field, so stay tuned. This is our group. Um, I think we are able on this slide to have some of our nurses and our radiation oncologists are over here. They weren't here today because they're at the meeting that Dr. Kaufman just left to go to. And this guy here is Levy Sokol, who's actually across the street uh, working right now in, uh, in the cafeteria reading films on our patients. He's our radiologist. He's absolutely invaluable. Comes to all of our tumor boards and, you know, I have a question. Can you just pull up the film? I need you to take a closer look at that spot for me. Very, very good. Very, very collaborative. These ladies back here are our coordinators and research nurses, and, and Chandrika is the advanced practice nurse who works with our unit. So overall, it's just it's a great team and a, and a joy to work with and a joy to, to help to take care of you. And this is everybody. And finally, at the end of the day, we acknowledge you, our patients, and your families uh, for, for giving us the privilege of caring for you.